You're listening to Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. We appreciate you tuning in to one of our pre-recorded episodes. Mark, to the grocery store, pharmacy, or bank, or you were going to go to uh, essential workers, and that was it. No questions asked. If you were outside without a permit, you're going to be fine. And uh, everyone understand, uh, understood that, and everyone stayed in. Everyone did what they were supposed to do. Not were, they like doing it, good, were they doing good in terms of uh, wearing masks here in North Carolina? We're seeing a lot of folks that still aren't wearing the mask uh, and not doing a good job of doing that in terms of uh, trying to um, halt the spread. Yeah, it, I, you know, I see, I watch the news sometimes, and I see people protesting in these cities and I I don't understand it. I, I really don't understand it. And from a global perspective, uh, people have come to the conclusion that the USA has basically lost its mind. Yeah, I think a lot of people have been thinking that for a, a number of years about us globally, uh, particularly with kind of the political landscape that is going on in the uh, United States and everything. So I think a lot of folks uh, have been having that kind of... of uh, concern about us for a uh, number of years. Yeah. How did you get involved in the uh, global business world and everything? Because like I said, I've been watching you uh, on Sri, and I know that you've been definitely involved in that for a uh, number of years. But just tell me how you got involved in the whole global um, economical situation, because that's not something that a lot of us do on a regular basis. Well, it started back, um, I think it was... I worked for Martha Stewart for like nine years and I was vice president of human resources there. And when I left there, I had an opportunity to travel to China as a global ambassador for human resources. They took about 30 of us from the US as a part of a group and we spent like three weeks between Beijing, Shanghai, and I think Guangzhou. And that kind of piqued my interest at that time. And the entire time I was there, I was trying to find a job there. But it didn't work out. And I came back and I started working for Xerox. And I was uh, heading up one of their consulting practices. And uh, I come in one day, check my email. And there was an email from a headhunter that had seen my profile on LinkedIn. And she said, very interesting background. Would you be interested in a an opportunity in the Middle East, specifically Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And I jumped at it. And within a matter of six weeks, I was on a flight flying from New York to Riyadh. And I lived there for a little over a year and a half. And then there was an opportunity came up here in Dubai as CEO for a great place to work. And I was able to get that, and I got to the bike where I really wanted to live, because living in Riyadh at that time was very restrictive. Uh, it's loosened up somewhat now, but during that time, it was extremely restrictive. And coming from New York, it was quite an adjustment, and I knew I couldn't, couldn't live there for a period of time. So I came to Dubai as a CEO, and by then I was trying to think of how can I transition to the next stage. And I just opened a firm uh, after my contract was up, uh, opened a consulting firm and like got a, my license like on a Tuesday or Wednesday and I started working the next week on a project. And it just kind of took off from there. So I started, I represent a couple of companies out of the US. I do my own consulting and um, you know, things just took off. How do you think we're doing in terms of uh the global market in terms of the U.S. being recognized. I mean, for a number of years, the U.S., I think, was seen as the global leader economically, but now I'm wondering if we're not taking a back seat to some of the other countries and things of that nature, countries like Japan, countries like, I would even argue, India and some other places. But how do you think we're doing yeah. in terms of being a global force? Not, any, not anymore. I mean, there was a time. Um, we're kind of the laughing stock of the world now. Um, I was in Vietnam last year for, I was there for about a week on a project. And I just noticed this country, I, you know, I never uh, went to the services, anything like that, but I had a lot of friends that got killed in Vietnam. 
And this company has come, I mean, this country has made a tremendous uh, return to being one of the global emerging markets. And I worked for, I did a project for a company, the Ben, ben Group, which is privately owned. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're into seven or eight different business verticals from automobile manufacturing to hospitality, uh, you name it. Um, and I looked at the entrepreneurial drive in the, in the Asia Pacific region, total, totally. And it's just so much different. Like kids will come out of school. Everyone is looking to start something. No one is specifically looking for a job. They, they may be looking for a job for a period of time, but their eyes are on the horizon as to see what's next. And that's what's different. Um, and I'm sure the same thing is in the US, but, the, but to, a, to a greater degree in the Asia, APAC region, it's that drive to start something. Um, I have business partners in Singapore and these guys are in their 30s. Um, they were working for a company till I got the hang of it, pulled out, started their own firm. And so this is the kind of kind of way it is. And I think one of the things that bothers me about folk, I'll say folk, is the fact that try and become an entrepreneur. I mean, it's it's not you gotta have the greatest, even if you went to a vacant store and opened a store for something. Um so I'll say that the entrepreneurial drive is heavier in this part of the region, even in the Middle East, than it is in the U.S. because it, it, they're not looking for a job. If they're looking for a job, it's only temporary until I can pull out and do something else. No one is looking to go work for an organization hoping they could be there for 20 years. And that's what's going on in the U.S. I've noticed that for a number of years, that people seem to be um, having that whole job mentality of just wanting a job and a job that you stay in for 10, 15, 20 years things of that nature. Um, some of my friends have actually compared it to the plantation mentality. Um, and I know that that's a term that some folks have used that are uh, more political activists and things of that nature. But yeah. I don't know that I see enough folks that are trying to do business on a regular and consistent basis and trying to develop their own business. And I'm wondering if part of that is in our education system, because a lot of times our education system encourages people to go to work for somebody else and things of that nature, both not just on the grade school level, but I would even argue on the college level. I mean, you have some great schools. I'm here in Durham and we have Duke, which has the Fuquay School of Business and some others, but um, yeah. of course, Harvard has some great business departments, but so many of our colleges seem to concentrate on just teaching people to go get a job. And for that job, um, it's kind of like that stereotype of get the job, get the wife, um, you know, have the 2.5 kids. Yeah, check, and out, the check out all the boxes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think it's, uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't really attribute it to education because uh, a lot of people that are, you know, I know people that have gone to Harvard Business School and they've come out with a drive to open their own business. They were never looking to be that long-term employee. And I knew that one day, even when I was growing up, I didn't, I knew I never wanted a job to go work for somebody else. I, when I, I started at Martha Stewart as a trainer, that's the longest tenure I've ever had on a job. Uh, and I stayed there for nine and a half years. I started as a trainer. I ended as vice president of human resources. But I always had in the back of my mind that that's what I wanted to do. Now, for a period of time before I went there, I opened a, uh, there was a gentleman, an older white gentleman who owned a convenience store in East Orange, New Jersey. And I heard someone say he was going to sell it. He wanted to sell it. And I went to him and struck a deal, mortgaged my house, and I bought that store. And I turned it into kind of a black version of a, con of a convenience store, which meant that I had bread pudding, I had coconut cakes, I had German chocolate cakes, I had sweet potato pies, all those kind of delicacies. Um, hero sandwiches, large sandwiches, all those kind of things. But there was a lot of vacant stores there and no one was opening stores. But meanwhile, everyone's complaining about the neighborhood is being taken over. And I said, put your money together and, and open a store. You know, these guys want to rent these stores and open a store, come up with an idea, buy some goods and start selling it. I look here in Dubai 
And you have so many people from other countries that have come here and opened up businesses. From Indians, from, from Europe, like myself. Um, because the opportunity is there. And you just have to spec it out, put your plan together and try something. So when I was, the last role I had as CEO, um, I, it was about time that I knew I wasn't going to want to do this anymore. So my thought was, do I pack it up and go back to USA and try and do something there? So I said, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give it one year because it's not a, it doesn't cost a lot. You can go, you can go out tomorrow morning and be registered within by 24 hours and have a business license. That's just how easy it is. And I said, you know what? I'll give it a year. Now, one of the things I did when I was in Saudi Arabia, when I look back on it, and it was the smartest thing I, that I have ever done, was that I started speaking at conferences. Hmm. Because when I was living in Saudi, there was nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do. So I, I did a search online for uh, HR, conference, HR conferences in the Middle East. And I got a list of about 20. So I took the top three, sent the, found out who was one of the organizers, sent the person a note, here's who I am, New York based, speak at conferences, getting settled here. If anyone backs out of your conference, if you get me a flight, I'll present. I sent that out on a Thursday morning, by Sunday night, I had three offers. Wow, three people had already backed out of their. Um... Well, no, no, I don't know whether they backed out or not, but I, but I wasn't going to write you to say, "Can I speak?" Right. Please help me to speak. I, no, I said, "I'm your backup. If anyone backs out, let me know." And for some reason or another, that hit because when you're in a conference business, mm -hmm. you'd be surprised how many times the day before the conference, someone calls and said something came up and I can't make it. Happens all the time. And I knew that. So when I sent this note on this Thursday, I got a note back and I was flying to Istanbul, um, Zagreb, and I flew to, I think, Hong Kong. I, I'm sorry, Singapore. Now, I know one of the things that people have been talking about doing, I was wondering if you think that this is going to happen um, or what your thoughts are, but some people have been talking about that after we get out of this um, COVID era, that travel will kind of like come back in force because a lot of countries are actually reaching out. I know like even some of the African countries apparently have been reaching out to try to get some of the citizens of the United States, particularly African Americans, to come to their country to help with the building of the economy. Do you think that this will, con is, is this happening and will this continue to happen once we get on these more travel kind of things? I know I was earlier talking today to a friend of mine in Vegas and they were actually telling me that I need to fly out there just to visit them because it's only like, an, I think they said an $11 flight on Frontier. So I know the airlines are yeah. struggling, yeah. so they're trying to get whatever they can get going flight-wise. Yeah, well, see, my because of the type of work I do, I'm normally on a flight in a different country every week. And so as a result of, uh, as a result of that, all of that's over with for now. My last trip was to Bangkok right before they closed it down. Now, I'm still in touch with my people across the globe, and everybody's just kind of waiting because they know it's going to start back up, and um, the airlines are going to open back up, and um, that's going to be it. I mean, the airline industry is not going to go under. Some weaker uh, uh, companies may not make it, but I never flo I, I never would fly those little budget airlines anyway. I was mm -hmm. always would fly the Emirates and the uh, Qatar Airways and so they're backed by the government and they're, they're going to come back in business. I mean, the way that I look at the virus, it's just kind of a lull now. Mm -hmm. So I've been online. Um, I, online, I was, last week I was online every day. I did, I did four webinars last week and I did, a, I conducted a training session online. Right before you, I did an interview for because I, I have um, this series called the CEO series where I interview top executives. So I interviewed 